My name is Hyun Jong Su, and I'm very delighted to see the opening of the seminar under the theme of Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, its status and response by Korea. The co-organizers of today's seminar held an international seminar with overseas and domestic experts as soon as the European Commission announced a proposal for an EU carbon border adjustment mechanism in last July for the purpose of improving the understanding of many people at home and abroad. The purpose of today's seminar is to share the responses of Korea and other countries to newly announced US legislation and explore our future responses. It's very certain that carbon pricing is a very important issue in our response to climate change, which cannot be delayed any longer. However, it is not easy to make the carbon pricing system take root, given the different circumstances faced by different countries as each country responds to climate change at the national level under the Paris Agreement. The EU has made various efforts to respond to climate change and when the issue of protecting industrial competitiveness in the region arise, it plans to introduce the carbon border adjustment mechanism as part of its response to climate change, which is also called 455. Korea and other countries around the world need to respond to this new mechanism. In Korea, as of the export volume of 2019, if EU CBAM will be implemented, the impact is analyzed in the report and many countries, including Turkey, Ukraine, and Korea will be impacted by the implementation of the EU CBAM. So many institutions in Korea are analyzing the impact of CBAM and in last July, Bank of Korea analyzed the impact. And according to the data, indirect and direct impact will be expected. But at the same time, there will be a positive impact as well as a negative impact. So for the European and the US market, uh, the new mechanism will help uh, Korea to increase the share of the export. So we need to respond to this new mechanism well, and we have uh, carbon related policies which are under review now. Yesterday, according to the newspaper, Herald Economy, the European International Trade Commission has a European reform group and they move out ahead of the original schedule of implementing uh, this system by one year from 2022 to 2025. So we need to keep close watch on the EU's development. I hope that this seminar will serve as a good opportunity to improve your understanding on the new mechanism and help you find a good measures to respond to the situation. Finally, I'd like to thank CS Lab and the CGCMG and the Ministry of Environment for organizing and sponsoring this seminar. Thank you very much. Now, I'm the moderator of the presentation session, so I will proceed. The first presenter is Professor Chung so Young of Korea University and who will make a presentation under the theme of international status on the EU CBAM and it will take about 10 or 15 minutes and which will be followed by the presentation by Kwon dong Hyuk, head of the BNZ partners and 
Zhao Lu uh, of the EDF China will make a presentation. As introduced, I am Soyoung Chang, Professor of Korea University. Among other speakers, I will be the first speaker and Basically, I'm going to touch upon the global trend centering on the CBAM. And then when it comes to the Korea policy implications will be also presented and also global trend among them, the global Chinese trend will be also been presented by the renowned speaker in this field. And also um, there will be a general Q&A and panel discussions I have created or uh, came up with the English version of my slides as the major um, audiences are Korean, so I'm going to speak in Korean. And this uh, slide was prepared by not only me, but also our research fellow of CHS the lab as well. First, we need to understand the concept of the border carbon adjustment. The This um, C BCA is very important because when we tackle the climate issues globally, the efforts are being made by each country globally, but the situations and context and the policies are varying. So how to coordinate them will be very important. So when a, out of this importance, this has begun to be introduced. So various efforts in some light, the negative impacts or undesirable effects should be reduced. And that it is the very starting point of the BCA. To simply put, when we think about the carbon price domestically, if even though we do have a well-developed policy locally, but the foreign producer products should be reflected these carbon prices so we have to tackle that in a more specifically, and that is a very strong point of the border carbon adjustment. So specifically, what kind of issues that we should look into? The most important thing is that we need to prevent the carbon leakage, of course. And then as I first mentioned, there are various uh, competitions among the product in the sense that we need to create a leveling field for this competition. And also, as we interact, the domestic climate policy of each country should be strengthened. And also recently, as we can see from the EU in relation to the ETS, there's ongoing discussion and there are some topics of uh, whether to deal with the free allowances or not. As you know, when it comes to the BCA, there are many design options, of course, but there are some of the domestic tests options or tariff option. And recently, as we can see from the CBAM, it, we can also link to the ETS as well. Let's just provide you the background. In relation to the BCA, there was a, a discussion on the environment and trade in the past. For example, the domestic taxes were dealt also as an issue. So related to the issues of uh, environment and trade, traces back to the 1990s. And also there is a very long time and also a very, um, interest cases. By post 2021, the negotiation has brought about and that has been first negotiated. Maybe those who are involved in the negotiation and uh, those who have involved in policy setting, there was uh, some strong um, issues raised on the carbon border adjustment issues and so on. And back then, that has not been fully taken place. There were just consideration around it. And after that, it was somewhat abated. Then EU uh, has announced the Green New Deal. And then in the middle, there was a COVID-19 outbreak. After this, the BCA issues 
was raised with a strong commitment made by the EU. And after the integration of the US Biden administration, it hasn't been really specifically came up, but there was uh, there are discussions too. So I might consider these issues more in details. And we have to think about whether these are compatible to the free trade issue is also a very important issue. So the new WTO Director General was appointed and said that in the, there are many uh, different, there was a differences in the international setting considering on this issue. So in July 14 this year at EU Commission, they have announced the CBAM proposal. And these are the background and overall process. The discussions has become more concretized and there was some visibility to brought about in reality. And we can say that. When it comes to EU, when we look into the details, as you have seen in 2019, December, the EU announced the Green New Deal and to protect their industrial competitiveness, they say first proposed CBAM. And after going serious process in 2021, July 14th this year, the EU's um, CBAM law was adopted. And this is not a definite one. Uh, between 2023 to 25, there will be a transitional phase, sort of a pilot phase, and then the full Im implementation will take place in 2026. As you know, inside the EU, it takes about one and a half years to fully enact it. So in order to uh, fully implement this, there are many um, works are going on. And also the friends will take a leadership role in EU uh, commission. So, and also France is also one of the advocate, ad, uh, one of the um, proponent to the CBAM. So during this process, what kind of trend we have to look into will be very critical as well. So, the proposal of the EU CBAM is as follows. This is the uh, draft of the proposal. And when you look at the chapter four, there is a CBAM certificate and centering on that, they set the price and so on. The, and when you look at the chapter nine, there is about the EU ETS issues and also various interests stakeholders are involved. So not only the technical things, but political aspects, there are very important and very critical issues. You can see. And now I'm going to talk about more about basic structure of the USCBM. For the imports, the EU businesses must pay according to the certificate and that is be under the EU ETS, that is the major point. And also if the imported goods like uh, which are produced in the third country, for example, if our product is sold to the EU and if we pay the price before then that will be fully deducted. And when it comes to the Norway in specific sector, they do import as uh, export to EU a lot. So in this case, that will be exempted for the CBAM. So through this, in link with the ETS, the EU announced that will run the system or mechanism. Compared to the initial proposal, the July proposal has been somewhat alleviated and they reduced in scope. There are but five sectors. There are cement, fertilizer, electricity, aluminum, and iron steel. So there are five categories or sectors. 
The selection criteria for them is as follows. When the sectors are high, have high risk of carbon leakage or covering more than 45% of the CO2 emissions of ATS sectors, and also there may be a lot of administrative works involved. So they also chose the administrative feasibility as an important selection criteria as well, according to EU Commission. So even if the proposal was announced and announced, but there is not a right away implementation of this, rather there will be the transitional phase. So for the CBAM, of course, if there is some discrepancy in prices, so they should first collect the information. So from 2023 to 2025, there will be a transitional phase where they're going to focus on collecting information only, but not money. And then full operation will take place in 2026. This will be very interesting in terms of uh, in the perspective of the EU, but the report and other things will be made by other countries uh, after the CBAM in full operation. So we have to look into a more broader um, picture in terms of the implication. Anyway, uh, EU announced that, that the full, full operation will take place in 2026. So we have to wait and see what is going to be unfold. This is one of the material that the EU has created. And when you look at this uh, phase, the transition period between 2023 and 2025, that will be focusing on collection of information. And then they will be phasing out this kind of uh, fees. For example, fee 455, as the vice minister mentioned, the free allocation will be reduced a lot and there will be some remaining free allocation that will be operated with that. And by 2036 and onward, there will be a full CBAM mechanisms that will be fully in operation. So there will be a gradual phase in of the CBAM. Next, in relation to CBAM, what kind of issues there will be? Well, we have to take a look at that. Of course, in various sectors and various issues can be arise. First, the scope of the CBAM. As I mentioned, there are five sectors, and among them, there will be free allowances issues involved. So it, these five sectors, from the perspective of the EU, will expand further, but that will not uh, take place for like five or 10 years, but it will take a longer time. So if that is well implemented and smoothly carried out, then the scope will be expanded. When it comes to the technical aspect, our country and other country, one of the important things in the EU statement that how do we calculate the amount of emissions? The criteria or the calculated method can be very critical. So calculate embedded emissions, the standard I to come up with the standard is very important for Korea and to verify the monitoring and reporting will be very important as well. So all countries, specifically Korea will be very important, will have a great interest in this because that will be critical. And there will be a lot of issues on related to the ETS as we have the Asian wide ETS as a few countries with this. So how we're going to uh, come up or respond to that will be very important. Compliance with FTA. There is a existing Korea uh, EU FTA. There are broader and general um, definitions of the environmental sectors, but we have to uh, see specifically what kind of things are in compliance with the FTA with us later on. And if there's any revenues that are generated in the future, how to use that will be very critical, whether that will be used for the industry again, or that will be used for the vulnerable or marginalized, and how we're going to consider LDCs. Well, under context of the green 
ODA context? Will they will help the LDCs with the revenue? Well, we have to also uh, consider all these aspects later on. Next. I also uh, mentioned briefly about the WTO compliance due to, in the interest of time, I cannot uh, specifically say in details, but there are some areas that we have to review, for example, NFA, NFN treatment issues. So that is the very basis for the free trade and also the quota issues and also subsidies. For example, free allowance of the EU, for many countries, so view that as a uh, subsidies. Why it is allowed to see them? Is it, uh, it is violating the free trade? There are some criticism, but some say, specifically you say it is good because um, it has the environmental protection cause. And there is uh, some general exceptions for the environment sectors. So you have to take a closer look at them as well. And also border tax adjustment. We have to take account of the tax issues. And also when it comes to the ETS, we have to review the WTO's issues as well or compliances elements as well. I have a mention about the WTO and there are about a, a CBAM issues and where these kind of issues will be discussed, that will be also important area. Of course, uh, this CBAM will be implemented unilaterally by the EU, but there is a US and Canada and other countries who will follow the suit. So I believe that will be the very basics discussions in the sense, I believe the WTO will be very critical. And in G20, generally, considering the carbon pricing policy, it is likely that they will play a very important role. So I think we can find some of the uh, signals, such as signals as well. And OECD is very important. Also, UNFCCC is important in this discourse, but whether they are going to involve in this in negotiations in directly well, but we need to uh, see uh, what's going on with the UNFCC's move. So as a uh, general rule, whether the CBA will remain in unilateral implementation or will these be moved into the multilateral discourse, we have to see the trend in the future. As Vice Minister Yoon said that the Korea is one of the important co countries for the EU CBAM, uh, except electricity, I believe the Korea and other countries are heavily influenced, will be influenced. So I got, came up with the top exporters in four sectors. So when it comes to the iron steel and cooling Korea, there will be a countries that will get direct impact. And when it comes to aluminum, Norway is the top exporter, but it is not linked with the ETS, but the country will be exempted. Then the Russia will be issued. When it comes to the ECBAM, I believe that Turkey and uh, Russia will be some of the uh, challenged, but as our country can be impacted. So we have to co cope with um, these countries to that in policy-wise aspect and to interact together to come up with the response to the possible impact. And I'm going to talk about the EU in a brief manner because other speaker will mention in detail. Well, they said that they were going to uh, follow the global trend in this of uh, um, re in uh, reducing the carbon emissions but there is just some uh, variabilities like the political things as well so we need to be up to date for their trend as well and I believe the Chinese expert here so he, she's going to talk about China as response so uh, anyway, um, there is ATS in place in China, and some of the sectors are important, such as iron and uh, steel, but basically China said that there is some res reserved um, or 
position to the EU CPM. And there are some similarity between Japan and our country because there is no national ETS. The former Prime Minister Suga said that the Japan may consider carbon pricing in some instances, but they did not move to say that they will fully cooperate with the EU in this end. But there will there are some general discussions centering on this topic. The Canada, for example, they said they were going to create their own CBAN and they wanted to cooperate with the EU. Then we have to come. We need to analyze to some of the policy implications whether we need to create our EU-like um, EU CBAM going forward. So implications for Korea. Rather than have a preemptive actions, but we need to wait and see, and we need to develop our strategy for the response. And as I mentioned, we have to monitor closely the EU CBAM legislative process and also we have to share the information as we have organized this uh, seminar in this respect. We need to also boost cooperation between other key countries. And also the participation in CBAM discussion is very important and especially WTO will be very critical element here. And also what kind of a stance that EU or US will have will be very important. So we have to pay attention to the EU US's response and their position. And of course we do have ATS. So how we're going to prepare for the response for the CFM will be very important, I think. So I hope I come up with this a, a general overview on the global uh, trend on the EUC band. So I hope it served well for you. With this, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor. There was a very comprehensive and very complete overview of the current status of the EUC BAM and the consideration elements as well. Well, perhaps the government or academia and should be uh, consider the point that you have mentioned to see the trend. Then we're going to have the second presentation. Hello, my name is Kwon dong Hyo from BMD Partners. For the past five years, I have been studied and worked for the ambition trading system in Korea. And the, when the CBAM issue came up, I analyzed uh, the impact of the Korean economy and the companies by CBAM. And I'd like to share with you uh, some of my studies and analysis. Professor Chong gave us an overview on the EU CBAM. And I'd like to talk about the impact of the CBAM on Korean companies. Before we go over the impact of the Korean companies, I'd like to uh, talk about the summary of the EU CBAM first. This is the key structure of EU CBAM. As you can see in the picture below, the imported good CBAM product and its GHG emission is multiplied by EU ETS's carbon price. And this is the preliminary cost of EU CBAM. EU has not pronounced how to deal with it specifically, but when we look at the details of the CBAM, you can see the link between the CBAM and the ETS. So I think that product benchmark method will be followed for the calculation of the 
CO2 emissions under the CBAM with necessary modifications. And second, there is a free allocation to EU companies for the same product is deducted. And it will be remaining by 2035. So the free allocation will be deducted. EU ETS and EU CBAM were announced in July this year. And for the CBAM legislation, uh, it mentioned the free allocation uh, deduction. And EU, EU ETS's legislation talks about the gradual deduction of free allocation. So we need to keep close eyes on the legislative process of those two. Industries like steel and iron and fertilizers need to pay attention to the latest development of the EU side. And the third one is the additional reduction if there is a carbon price paid in the country of origin, but there is no specific measures how to measure the pri carbon price paid in a country of origin. So we, we think that the calculation can be done uh, based on the carbon emissions and the carbon price under the Korean ETS but we are not sure at this moment how to calculate uh, the carbon price paid in the country of origin. So we need to wait and see uh, what development is made in this regard. The carbon price is lower in Korea than the EU. Up until 2019 or early 2020, carbon price was higher than that in Korea in that that in the EU. So there were many discussions regarding the differences of carbon price between Korea and the EU. So we need to see and watch the details about the price paid in country of origin. So I wonder what kind of method will be applied regarding the calculation of carbon price paid in the country of origin. So EU said that it will impose the calculated cost on the imported product. So many people think that Korean companies will need to pay more under the EU CBAM system, but some people say that it could serve as an opportunity to improve the competitiveness. In my opinion, I think that if the EU implements the CBAM and protect the cement and iron and steel industry and apply the same system to its own companies, I think that imposing the carbon cost on product could increase the cost of production, but it will not be necessarily the lowering of the competitiveness, lowering because other competitors, we need to pay for the cost under the same scheme. So it will not necessarily lead to the lowering of the competitiveness. But I think two factors are very important. The first one is how to calculate the emission correctly. And it says that lower 10% lower, lower of the European companies will be the basis for calculating the carbon emissions if there is no clear evidence and no clear method of calculating the CO2 emissions. So it is necessary to calculate and verify the embedded emissions correctly. And the second important thing is to reduce the carbon intensity compared to competitors. So to increase the competitiveness, companies need to reduce the carbon intensity. 
And with this background, I'd like to talk about the Korean companies' cases. And if companies need to pay the cost of carbon, there is a mechanism that consider the cost paid in the country of origin. So as a Korean government, it is better uh, to make the companies pay the price in Korea, not in Europe and to prevent the outflow of the national wealth. I think it is very important to make companies pay more in Korea. Second, I'd like to talk about the KETS status and net zero plan. Korea implemented the first carbon trading system in 2015. And as of 2022, we are in the third phase and according to the Korea ETS system, I think some countries have laws related to the ETS, but in Korea, it will be implemented at the five minute, five year interval. And the phase two started in 2018 and the auction and the free allocation started. And in the phase three, there will be 90% free allocation on non-CL sector. It means that 10% auction. When we look at the figures, Korean system may not be strong enough and strict enough. And the third one is that as of 2021, 684 companies are included in the KETS. And all companies that meet the certain requirement are included in the KETS system. And direct and indirect emissions are regulated under this KETS system. So KETS covers about 73% of the country's total emissions. And in the U EU, the half of the emissions are covered under the ETS system, while a Korea ETS covers a lot of the country's total emissions. So currently the Korea ETS carbon price is about 25 euro and that of EU is three times higher than that of Korea. The angle carbon price changes depending on the supply and demand of the carbon emission rights. And Korea adjusted the NDC upward. So we will see some changes in the carbon price. Korea has a strict regulation and policies. So 684 companies are included in the KETS and about 1000 companies in total are governed and covered under the government policies and system. We have relevant laws in Korea, and the right picture shows the National Greenhouse Gas Management System. These kind of data and information are managed and collected by the computer system, not by manually. The data are managed very well, and companies are following the rules based on the strict rules. And regarding the calculation of the embedded emission, I think Korea is doing well to some extent because embedded emission, which is related to the product benchmark in the EU system, we have a very well established system. The reason is that 
we have applied the BM method in the initial stage of the regulation and the for the cement and the steel industry benchmark allocation is applied. Those specific processes will be the target of the calculation, not the whole company's emission. But fertilizers and aluminum sector, for example, aluminum sector, we are not subject to the rule. And for the fertilizers, the main process is to generate the nitrogen. But Korean companies already conducted the CDM uh, system, so it is not included in the system. So BM method is not applicable to those sectors. You can see the product benchmarking boundary of Korea and the EU. And you can see that the boundary of the two countries may be different. The reason is that there are some differences in the product. So these should be adjusted and calculated. And this can be calculated because when companies report the emissions, they have and keep the report. So we can calculate uh, the embedded emissions. Sometimes when Korean companies produce their products in other countries, like import the raw materials to Korea, process it in Korea and export it to Euro Europe, it may be hard to calculate the emissions by overseas suppliers. So in this regard, the government level support or measures may be necessary. This is related to the carbon price paid in the country of origin. Basically to increase the carbon price paid in the country of origin, it is need to reduce the free allocation. Free allocation reduction means that the companies need to pay more The first one is that for Korea's cement and other industry, benchmark method is applied. Benchmark method is based on the average of the Korean company's emissions. But according to the basic plan released by the government in 2019, the benchmarking line will be adjusted to based on the BAT. It means that companies will face a lower free allocation amount. And the right one explains the cap increased by phase. And cap is set based on the NDC. And if CANDC is a set of word, the cap will decrease. And then the free allocation amount to the companies will decrease as well. So in that case, the outflow of national wealth can be prevented. This slide shows the key elements of the current discussion. And this is the ultimate way to reduce the carbon emissions. It is important to measure the carbon emissions, but actual reduction of the emissions is important as well. I cannot say each company's impact or each company's movement, but as you know, the Korean government establish the goal of 2030 NDC and 2050 net zero uh, plan after lengthy discussion with the industry. And the government established an ambitious goal. 
the steel industry declared that they will reduce the carbon emissions by 95% compared to 2018 level. And they will reduce the process and they will uh, change the process to, uh, to generate less carbon emissions. Even though it is not discussed in the EUC ban, petrochemical and oil refining industries are generating carbon emissions significantly. So this industry announced that they will change the raw materials from petroleum naphtha to bio naphtha. So it was not the decision made by the government alone. This ambitious goal was established based on the discussion with the industries. So if the plan can be implemented well, we can achieve that goal. And the CBAM can serve as an opportunity to increase the industrial competitiveness of Korea. This is all I prepared. And if there is any questions, I can handle it in the discussion session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Quine. And that was very in-depth in discussions that you have um, provided. And as a ETS nationwide Korea, for the first time we have introduced the system. And why did we have to uh, introduced the ETS in the past, there was some criticism. And I believe that uh, in the hindsight, it was a really good um, preemptive action that we have taken. And also we have a high level of the transparency. So compared to other countries, maybe this could be some of the burdens to the industries, I think. So, Ultimately, as you mentioned, for the carbon neutrality, we are stepping toward with the great commitment. And I believe that, uh, thank you for your presentation in the sense, and I do agree with you very well. Uh, thank you for the warm invitation from Professor Chan and the organizer of these events. Um, it quite, um, I'm quite happy to learn more about CBAM and Korea's experience as uh, Korea has started its national ETS way before China and Korea actually shared a lot of similar um, design characteristic with China. And um, I'd like to share a little bit of my personal view on China's um, situation right now. Um, so I'd love to start my presentation with a formal response from the Chinese government on this issue. Um, this was happened this July uh, when the spokesman of China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment received a press conference about um, environment and climate issue. One reporter asked what their feedback on CBAM. So basically what Chinese official um, said was um, like this. Um, the trend of global climate collaboration is reducing tariff, reducing barrier, and trying to promote trade investment liberalization. Um, and uh, it is very critical guarantee to fight climate change and promote sustainable development globally and build a community with a shared future of mankind. So basically what Chinese government is trying to say here is, um, CBAM is not really helping with global collaboration. And also the spokesman said it is a unilateral measure like what Professor Chan previously mentioned. And they consider it more of a trade policy than a climate policy. Um, and it's maybe kind of violate the WHO rules and could damage the mutual trust between different parties, especially between the developing country and developed country. So it expands climate change issue to trade areas. Um, and also it's not really consistent with the principle of UN C and Paris Agreement as um, a lot of the climate change world, people talk about CBDR, for example, and the Paris Agreement was considered a bottom-up approach. 
Um, so it could harm the enthusiasm and ability of all parties to deal with climate change issues. And also the spokesman elaborated a little bit saying that by pushing um, a CBAM from EU, you still need to do a lot of other efforts in order to do it scientifically. For example, like the previous two experts talked about um, a methodology, a MRV methodology, accounting methodology on calculate what are the embedded carbon footprint of different, um, different products. And historically, EU and US, uh, right now EU and US count for over 20% of global greenhouse gas emission, but historically EU account more than a quarter of accumulative historical emission. Um, however, developing countries uh, have less and even less per capita emission. Um, so EU need to be careful about the disagreement between different uh, world. Um, so they said, think uh, multilateralism is the way to solve climate change issue. Uh, but on the other hand, China is also um, prepared, trying to pre get prepared for this um, policy that may come in the future. So um, because China considers more of a trade policy, so I want to talk a little bit about the trade between you and uh, China. So China is currently the world's largest exporting country uh, to EU and EU's biggest trading partners. Um, so uh, currently the embedded emission of EU's export to EU, uh, uh, China's export to EU are relatively high, mainly because the energy consumption st structure of China is more um, on coal and the production technologies and also the proportion of carbon in intensity goods that's uh, been exported to EU. And it is estimated that in the year of 2014, around 26% uh, of the embedded emission in the EU import came from China. So based on an estimation conducted by Tsinghua University, one of the top universities in, in China, it indicates that in the year of 2018, the emission embedded in China's import from, from EU is about 30 million tons of CO2 equivalent, um, but the exported emission reaches 270 million tons. So it's huge difference here. So significant difference in import and export makes the EU, uh, uh, makes the EU China trade difference. And it's one of the critical uh, thinking beyond behind this uh, CBAM infrastructure design. So about industries that will be influenced, so in terms of the uh, value of good transport from uh, China to EU, um, basically the machinery, the electricity pro products, textile, metals, chemicals are of the most value. Um, and also they are on the carbon leakage list of EU ETS, but they are not very likely to be included in the first phase uh, as indicated previously. Uh, because of various reasons, some of them because of the complexity of uh, MRV methodology, and also they are not in, embedded with huge carbon emission footprint. Um, so the most likely industries to be influenced are iron, steel, cement, and aluminum. Um, power sector is not really one of it because it's not really trade um, between China and EU, although it's uh, considered as one of the key sectors by CBM. So these three sectors have relatively solid data foundation and very simple uh, value chain and the huge amount of um, trade between you and China. So they are likely to be think about to cover in the first phase. Um, so this, um, the topic is relatively new, um, but a lot of researchers has been doing research related to this. Um, so here are a list of research um, results by different um, by different experts. So basically, because of CBAM design hasn't been finalized yet, um, so it's there's a lot of uncertainties. And basically, whether to cover the entire life cycle e emission or footprint of a product or only part of it, and whether it's based on China's average carbon intensity or it's based on EU's carbon intensity, and what is the price difference. Um, so it influenced the, the, the result a little bit, but in general, the result is China's um, export to EU will be reduced or the cost of China's uh, export to EU will be significant, uh, significantly increased uh, because of CBAM. 
So according to, to, to some of, for example, according to the CBAN proposal Annex 1 and um, the UN contract list, um, climate change, uh, the Tsinghua University has done the research uh, to see uh, how China is influenced by the CBAM um, potentially based on 2016 to 2020 data. So based on, based on these assumptions, um, China's uh, total value of trade value influenced by CBAM will be around 6 billion US dollars, representing 1.8% of, of China's total export to EU. So uh, three quarters are from iron steel, one quarter is from aluminum. So cement, fertilizer are relatively small. So if we, do, we don't consider EU's free allocation, um, so the carbon, uh, and we assume the carbon pricing difference is around four, uh, 52 US dollars per ton, uh, which is, is even more right now. Um, the China's export to EU cost will increase by 300 million US dollars representing around 5% of total. Um, so, but that's very rough um, research results. And a lot of questions are actually raised by the industries uh, because they're considered, uh, they've no idea how much they will be influenced because of this question. For example, whether life cycle emission will be considered, for example, aluminum, majority of them are coming from the electrify process. Um, and whether direct and indirect emission will be both considered because Korean ETS and China ETS both considered direct and indirect, but you only have direct emissions. And what about information disclosure? A lot of enterprises is concerned about information disclosure rules that CBAM asked uh, to disclose more information than they are right now with current uh, legislative measure requirements. And also linkage with ETS, like previous two professors talked about, EU right now have free allocations. They haven't phased out um, free allocations. Uh, and even the plan to phase out free allocations later than the the, uh, the data of CBAM they proposed right now. And also China has majority of, uh, of the ETS are free allocated. And also the difference in carbon price. The price of carbon right now in China is around seven, six to seven US dollars. And the future price of EU ETS it's exceed, uh, yesterday was 80 euros. It's, it's crazy difference. And also different MRV standards. China has a very different, has uh, a set of MR, MRV said, which is different. Um, so whether this company will need to um, will need to follow both countries' uh, MRV standard will be another question. Will uh, will significantly increase their uh, cost and uh, their preparation for climate policies, and, and also difference in compliance cycle. So. We have conduct an industry survey. Basically, it's, we call it the China Carbon Survey. It's a several years survey. Um, and uh, this year we add a CBAM perspective into it. This is a rough uh, result. We haven't really finished the report yet, yet, but I'd love to share a little bit. So about 80% of the total companies that get interviewed believe CBAM have an impact to their import and export trade. And more than half of companies do not understand how CBAM will influence their industries and over 40 has saying that they have very limited understanding. So basically less than 5% of the companies saying that they understand CBAM and understand how they will be influenced. Um, and also one of the survey we done, yes, uh, last year estimate that China's industry's expectation to carbon price, to a price of carbon. So the estimation was, um, in the year of 2020, which is this year, um, the current carbon price in China will be around seven US dollars, which is quite uh, consistent, consistent with China's current ETS. Um, and then the industry's expectation of a price of carbon in 2025 is 10 US dollars ish. And in the 20 year of 2030, which is China's carbon peaking year is 15 US dollars. So we can see the significant difference between these numbers um, this price of carbon with the CBAM embedded price, which is around 40, 50 ish um, euro or US dollars per ton. So, in order to deal with, or maybe we are not saying that, but China has several um, climate policies and actions that they think um, when in the CBAM negotiation, it can talk about. 
um, including China's overall climate policy is to, or climate goals are to peak its emission by 2030 and achieve climate, uh, achieve carbon neutrality by the year of 2060. So in, in order to meet that, there's a set of policy, inc including total emission or CO2 emission control, energy intensity control, green certificate, climate financing, um, policy evaluation, policy makers evaluation, whether they they help their um, administrative uh, area to, to apply with the goals or a carbon market is one of the major one. So I'd love to use the rest of my time to talk a little bit about China's national carbon market. Um, so the coverage of carbon market, basically the threshold to be included into the carbon market is 26,000 tons of CO2 emission per year. It equals to 10,000 tons of standard coal consumption per year. So right now, only power generation sector is included into the national carbon market, um, it representing 4.5 billion tons of CO2. It covers more than 2,000 companies um, in China and representing 40% of China's total emission and 12.5% of global carbon emission right now. But the sector is not really influenced by CBAM. Um, there are other sectors that are going to be influenced. Um, China has identified eight major industry sectors are, are this eight. Um, petrochemical, chemical, building materials, basically cement, iron steel, non-ferrous are aluminum, paper making, and aviation. So all of these eight industry sectors um, are consistent of 31 subsectors representing more than 5 billion tons of CO2, 7,000 companies, and around 74% of China's total carbon emission. So these eight sectors will eventually be included into or covered by a price of carbon in China. And the first three sectors to be included is cement, iron steel, and aluminum. So they're consistent with the CBAM's focus as well. Um, so the current trading situation right now in China. Uh, China kick off its online trading or secondary carbon market in the July 16th of this year. So by now it's around six year, half a year, uh, six month, half a year. So the total trading volume um, is 40, uh, it's exceed uh, 48 million tons of CO2 and trading value exceeds 200 million tons, uh, a million RMB. So it's not sig that significant as what EU, Korea, uh, California carbon market has been, but it's the first year. And by the way, majority of the trade are through, through OTC over the counter trade, not secondary market trade, which because uh, majority of the market participants are SOEs, or we can see all of them are state-owned enterprises. So even though they have surplus, they don't want to sell. So China right now faces a super similar situation like what Korea faced years ago. Um, so this also has influence in the price of carbon in China currently. Um, so right now China's uh, initial ETS is trying to, to um, improve itself through, for example, legislation. So right now ETS don't have a, only have a legislative uh, order passed by the Ministry of ME, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. So we want to um, pass a state council level law, which give more enforcement power to the ETS because right now the, uh, the penalty is only three, 7,000 US dollar per company if you don't comply. So that's not significant enough. Um, and also the MRV standard need to be, um, be re, uh, updated. And offset um, market right now, uh, just kick off and covered expansion basically means more covered entities. So this also means um, in order to deal with or better prepare with uh, CBAN, uh, China, Chinese government, um, it's also ex um, it's, it's also working together with um, other companies or industry associations to, for example, develop allocation methodologies to update their MRVs to help them better prepare with uh, climate policies in the future. Um, so there's a lot of other um, things, for example, auctions right now has not been introduced yet. Uh, it's one of the top pri priority next year to, to give a a better sense of price of carbon to the private sectors. And the 
market participation right now only covered can entities are able to participate into the market so the comp the the government is trying to include institutional investors and others into the market and also derivatives right now only spot trading is allowed there's no futures there's there's nothing else um, so all of this will help China to have a more valuable or effective price of carbon and maybe increase the price of carbon in the future and then uh, have a better understand, understanding of um, climate policies and understanding of how the enterprises will deal with the, the climate policies in China or internationally. So, so that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Director. Zhao, for your uh, very detailed presentation on this issue. Uh, as you said, China is the largest country to uh, EU, so uh, China naturally is very sensitive to this C1 uh, uh, issue and, and has a very uh, strong reservation. Well, thank you very much, Vice Minister Yun. As Vice Minister Yun has moderated the first session and follow him, I'm going to lead the panel discussion as a moderator. The panel discussion today, uh, we're going to consider many aspects. And so we uh, try to invite the world renowned experts and so from a global perspective, we would like to have some input and opinion and insight. And as we are going to presentation and we are trying to also invite some of the renowned experts in this field to provide us some detailed information. We're going to have a four speakers and panelists today and they're going to present and then if we're going to have also more time. If we have more time, then we're going to allow some of the speakers to have more time later on after the four rounds of the discussion. And then we're going to begin the session first. We have a managing director, Hong Zhang, Hong Hyun Zhang of Korea Business Council for Sustainable Development. Next, we have Ms. Moon, Mr. Moon Jin Young, Head of Global Cooperation Strategy Team of Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. He's a very expert in this field. And also he sat next to me while discussing an, in a seminar, which we're dealing with the CBAM issue. Next, we have a research fellow, Mr. Kim Song Jin of KEI. After joining the KEI, he's an active member in other areas and fields, and he is very interested in this CBAM, and he is a very renowned person in this field. Next, we do we have um, Dr. Yi Go Eun, Research Fellow of CSD Lab. She recently earned a PhD, and then she is an active member of the CSD lab. And this is a very late hour, and I would like to thank her for participating today. And with that, I'm going to invite Managing Director Hong for the presentation. And well, the impact of the CBAN to the industry, that will be a huge, so... I believe that uh, you, I have given this opportunity to speak first. And also in 1990s, uh, what has been expected is that actually criticized, crit, crit, um, made it uh, real, um, realized by the EU's announcement on, in July. Uh, under the cause of the prevention of the carbon leakage. They're going to calculate the embedded emissions for the imported product to, and to they're going to provide or issue the certificate. When we look at the details, when we look at the major uh, purpose of the CBAM, there's a strong climate policies and related regulation are formulated to respond to 
the ever waning their competitiveness of their industries. Of course, they said that they are going to prevent the carbon leakage as well. And that is one of the cause. And the other is it the global a part of the global agreement that I wanted to extend it at efforts to increase the level of the participation into this agreement. So there are a couple of the goals of this mechanism. And maybe that is similar to China and as uh, Dr. Lulu uh, mentioned, in fact, when these have been implemented at a fair trade order will have great change. When it comes to the greater cause, they said that they are not going to undermine the fair and just trade. However, the top exporter countries may concern over the sea ban whether that will be undermining the fair trade. And these could be also serve as a um, trade barrier, according to some of the concern. And actually, the emission reduction efforts, for example, at the level of the EU, can be also introduced to other developing countries. So, so the late commerce can also think about that. So when we look at the implication of the domestic industry, implication of this to domestic industry, as Vice Minister mentioned, it will not undermine the competitiveness, but rather if we respond more, then we can change that into our opportunity. Yes, we can talk like that. However, in some of the C band, we have to look into the details. And when we do that, the government to government roles are greater rather than the industry's role. So we have to come up with a delicate and sophisticated responses. Otherwise, we are going to have our competitiveness lessened. When we operate in practice, Due to that can be a pressure to reduce the cost of the experts and that will also infl influence on the decrease of the exportation as well. So all the data, certification and other things along with the government and other countries, for example, the government holds the data. So the industry, are having some challenging aspects. Now the allowances, for example, we can have some of the opportunity to offset some of the challenges, but when we look at into the ETS system, then we can think like that. The original purpose of the ETS or the allowance is to reduce the area where the CO2 reduction is lessened, then we can reduce the CO2 emission overall. You can think that ETS is running well, operating well, but if there's any changes or replacement of raw materials or reduce the number of operations or purchasing the certificate or allowances. Well, these will be the challenges. And also if we finance uh, support these uh, small and medium sized companies so that the unique uh, energy industries to be used will be desirable way. But they are going awry with the original purpose in practice. So they just buy the credits and so on. And also the technical support, for example. 
replacing the fuels and so on could be one of the example and only 15% of these kind of technologies are viable to meet the national um, goal of upgrading or increasing the NDC. There are many investments are being made. However, the economical impact or the cost impact among the companies are still in initial stage because they do not have a set uh, method for the calculations and so on. So if we get all these details and if we consider well, and then we can respond to CBAM very well, I think. Because uh, we just are now seeing the surface of the CBAM, but we have to see the details of it to respond properly to that. So when it comes to free allowance, let's say, we have some exemptions inside this ETS scheme. And there are many other fringe conditions as well. And when we get this permission from the authorities and that will be some of the areas that we have to address in advance. Otherwise we can get the pricey um, credits or allowances. So we have to come up with the responsive process at the level of the authorities. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much for your remark. Technology innovation has been pursued by the industry and in response to climate change, industry has an awareness that they need to do more, but by sectors or by plant site, they face different circumstances. So when we consider all those things, it may be hard. So there are differences faced by the sectors. So this should be considered and discussed as Presenter Kwon dong -hyo presented our system well, and we have a Chinese expert. Each country has agreed uh, with uh, the big picture of the climate change response. So no one left behind principle should be applied to this climate change response. So we need to consider the overall picture and active participation by the industry is important, but there are some concerns in the industry that remains. Second, I'd like to invite Moon Jin Young, Head of Global Cooperation Strategy Team of KEIEP. Hello, my name is Moon Jin Young, and I'm working for the Global Cooperation Strategy Team of KIEP. Thank you for inviting me to this meaningful forum and seminar. And I learned a lot from the previous presentations. We have studied these environmental issues. And as Professor Zhang pointed out, we analyze a lot about the scenarios, like how to apply the ETS tax. And when we had a discussion with stakeholders, it was hard uh, to find their preferences. So when we surveyed, on a scale of one or two points, there were no strong preferences by the stakeholders. It means that they agree the overall picture, but even within the EU, there are some differences of stance and circumstances fa faced by each country. So regarding the specific method, there were no uh, agreement. But recently, the EU Commission announced a new proposal. And last week, 
we also talked about the new proposal of EU recently, and it is a proposal and the all EU members need to approve and consent uh, to the proposal. And there are many issues to be resolved to implement the new proposal. For example, how to uh, calculate the emissions in based on what cost and what price. And regarding the certificate, it may be hard to deal with the certificate, remaining certificate. And there are uncertainties regarding the implementation of the new system and the reliability of the evidence. And the exporters to the EU may face difficulties. And EU announced that it would apply the emissions uh, that is applicable to the lower 10% of the companies. So it may be hard to think it is reasonable or not. And the third countries may have an agreement with EU. So there are many options. So for Korea, we need to share what we can do well and what we are doing well with EU. And we need to introduce our efforts at the Korean level to EU. And we need to consider why EU wants to apply the new proposal. Basically, EU is concerned about the environmental issue seriously. And at the same time, it wants to improve its competitiveness by imposing the regulations on the exporters to EU. But it may be the unilateral rule set by the EU, and we need to consider whether all countries need to join their proposal. Some items were pointed out as the key items. So China, Russia, and India are exporting the key items to EU. And there are some data and information regarding the embedded emissions. And the embedded emission amount is high among emerging countries. So when we calculate the price, we analyze the impact of the new system on each country. Compared to emerging countries, Korea has less impact on the industries. That is because the differences of the embedded emissions in each country. And as Managing Director Hong pointed out, this system could put a burden on each country. But private sector need to face, will face a lot of burden and cost to prepare for the new system. That is the burden faced by companies in the private sector. And it will be implemented from 2026, but uh, companies need to report it uh, starting from 2023. So it may be a burden to companies so how to certify and verify the emissions and how to uh, prepare evidence and report it may be a problem for Korean companies. So we analyzed uh, which country will be influenced more by the C EU CBAM. We found out that the US will be less likely to be affected by the EU CBAM because US accounts for only 0.6% of the export to EU. So countries with the large export volume to EU will be influenced much. 
and steel companies and iron making companies and countries with higher amount of export volume to EU need to have a separate agreement. So we need to see the progress of this element. And people say that CBDR and RC, advanced countries and developing countries have different understanding and interpretation. Advanced countries say that all of us need to take action and developing countries say that advanced countries need to take responsibility more. And this principle should not be discriminatory depending on the status of the country. And there are some small countries in island countries with small economies and they will be also impacted. So international order and the domestic circumstances of each country are different. So we need to review the new proposal from our own perspective and indirectly and directly Korean companies are paying the cost of carbon emissions in the form of tax and regulation in Korea. So we need to consider the comprehensive amount of the burden paid by the Korean companies. And we need to develop a reasonable logic so that we can talk and discuss better with European Union. So immediate action should not be taken and we need to take the time to discuss further with relevant stakeholders. Thank you very much. So when it comes to the CBAM, uh, EU itself has not yet defined it completely and also other presenters on this consensus already mentioned, but when it comes to the state level, how to respond to the CBM? Well, one of the major points that Ms. Dr. Moon said that we have to consider everything and also from that, from my perspective, well, nobody will agree that the carbon price is important and nobody will agree that the we should not uh, respond to the climate crisis. So we have to pull our wisdoms and also we have to respond to these issues, I think. Next, I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Kim Song Jin for the presentation. You will have eight minutes. Hello, I am Kim Song Jin from KEI. KEI, I thank you very much for the invitation. I learned a lot and I do have a, a relatively short experiences, but I have a lot of considerations. So I'm going to share my idea. Broadly, I would like to divide into two topics. One, in a broader context of the CBAM, I would think I think we need to look into that. The second is the details of strategies or plan for the response. And I would like to talk about some of the, my idea in this respect. And so the first, when it comes to the a, uh, global environmental regulation, which is a greater context, as I am a researcher in this global uh, environment, I need to also talk about this regulation and it is expanding in the global trade framework and EU is leading in this trend. There are about 30, 6,000 regulations are as of now, but the regulations are increasing in numbers and among them 57, excuse me, 56% are the environmental regulation. That means the, the environmental regulations are on the rise in terms of numbers. Advanced countries led by the EU are expanding the regulations and as a part of the a climate change in environment sector, we have to look into this issue like um, IP, ICT, and health. The EU is trying to 
impose the regulation of their own to other countries. I think that is the sense of the CBM, I think. So the EU has the largest market and is the greatest consumer in the world. So they are trying to control the production of the producers, which are other countries. And also they are sending a message that they need to, the countries need to hear to the EU. So the protection of the environment and also to prevent their companies. There are creating the ripple effects, not only the internal other agreement, but also they are expanding their own regulations internally and outwardly as well. In 2006, the EU reach was set up and there was a regulation and approval for the chemicals, uh, for the harm, hard dose uh, regulations also uh, formed And there was a electric waste a regulation, which is called the WEI was introduced as well, respectively. All the exporters to the EU must follow and abide by this regulation. So the companies are quite um, meeting this kind of a standard. While they, these kind of regulations were introduced, uh, the companies and our countries uh, try to prepare for that and their technologies and other uh, standards have been upgraded accordingly as well. Now the CBAM is coming, upcoming, so we have to discuss a lot whether we have to prepare for more. Recently, the EU has unilaterally and uh, also uniquely for autonomous formula ETS. So it wanted to expand it to uh, the world as well. When it comes to the transportation, ETS system wanted to, the EU wanted to expand it overseas. That was uh, actually filed to the WTO. So from 2027, the emissions was frozen according to the grain agreement and the regulation target of the ETS will be linked to the marine and ocean uh, transportation and also IMO also is trying to increase the regulation. That means that the EU come up with a regulation that the international organization also try to meet the standards and so it is a sort of a forceful environment and going over the environment like ICT, IP, or the health, various forms of the regulations are happening in this uh, kind of a pattern. So we have to look into the pattern as well. And also the structural changes in our industries, uh, local industry, meeting this kind of a changes in, in regulations must be go in line. Of course, the low carbon is the most important and also reducing the GHG is important as other speakers mentioned. And to follow up on that, to give us some of the details, I believe that the, we need to come up with the data uh, that collects all, all um, low carbon or carbon embedded. Um, and also we have to collect that inventory data in this respect, I believe that it is really linked with the ESG. The existing CRSR and so on, like a good companies and social companies are viewed as sort of ESG companies, but that's different, I think, because the environment social governance is to be uh, enforced by companies too. Uh, make a public on how they are going to conduct their business according to the environment social governance. So it's not a really good uh, company, but it demands information that the company is actually complying with the or abiding by the laws or regulations. So the CO2 emissions and other emissions uh, report will be linked to the ESG, I think. So like a, a fundamental changes and the regulations and also system changes of the companies are all, will be followed, I think, and it should be as well. And I believe the pricing and is important. There are about to 75 dollars per one T CO2 equivalent as of now, but as other uh, people mentioned, the deduction is quite uh, and 
clear because they have to deduct the, the already paid one, but the deduction itself and the methodology are still not clearly set. So we have to calculate and also uh, come up with the subtracted amount of the already paid amount. So I believe that uh, we have to come up with these uh, things in a more urgent way. So for that, we need to have a data first and also impact assessment that is important. Now we do consider the existing industry when we do the impact assessment. The China wanted to come up with this carbon neutrality. So they have shut down the factories related to the iron and other um, coal producing factories and manufacturers. As a result, the price of the raw materials increased a lot, it spiked. That is very um, important implications that we have to take note of because the supply chain, a market alone will be changed in sync with the other changes from other countries or other areas. So like, um, as we can see from the Chinese uh, move. And so the Turkey and Russia, which will be affected by the ZBAM, um, also will create some of the effect. Don't... So now we have to consider all and all the experts that must join forces and pull wisdoms to respond to that, coming up with this um, wise solutions. The we have contracted with the EU Council while we we're introducing the ETS as it was unfamiliar to us. So we had to get the consultant services for that. For three years, we have about um, 500 million, excuse me, um, 5 million billion, uh, wine to get the consultancy. So to that end, for the CBAM, we need to get the support in this end. Also, we have to nurture talents accordingly to fit with that. Well, in terms of the environment, he made a, a comprehensive comment in a short period of time. Well, how the regulation on the environment evolved, the OECD has played a very pivotal role. So it has developed as an international regime. And also there is a clear contribution by EU, but on the, on the other side, on the other hand, as we have seen from the Kyoto Protocol, there is a distribution system in the world. So in order to extend into each single state, wh whether that was what EU wanted and what was the role that e US has played, we have to look into that. But as you rightly mentioned, when it comes to carbon pricing, I believe that EU has really initiated all this game. So we have to think that in a diverse perspective and when it comes to the response he mentioned in very details, while I was listening to him, the information and data of the world must be collected. And that is important, I think, how we are going to present to the EU and what kind of adjustment or coordination that we have to make. Well, I think that is important. In this sense, we have to come up with a standard to come up with the carbon pricing calculation. So I think that in this sense, Mr. Khan said that, that we have some strong point here. And other than the ETS, there are other characteristics that we have to work on. If the next present comes, then I believe that there are a lot of different in, um, stakeholders. So I believe that we need a lot of uh, coordination in the sense, the new leadership of the new president will be important. So we have to pay attention to that. We do have a two major presidential candidate hopefuls. So, so probably the, these two individuals will our aware of that so let's take pay attention to that last uh, this content will be dr lee Owen lee studied the overseas cases so she will share with you 
based on her study and research. If she is convenient with English, she will deliver the presentation in English. Hello, my name is Go Eun, research fellow of CSD Lab. It was helpful to listen to the cases of Korea and China and overall system of CBAM, and I will deliver my presentation in English.
Thank you. Professor Lee shared the analysis of the US cases and the Canadian cases. And she had an interview with the key stakeholders in the US and the Canada. And sometimes I think that there is an EU system which has advantage, but US does not have a interest. Norway is not linked to the ETS, but you, Norway had an exemption from the EUC ban. And uh, EU's main target is not the US, according to some sources. And for Canada, it's an interesting case. Canada has its own system, which is called BCA. I'm not sure whether it, what kind of system will be implemented, but they develop their own mechanism to respond to CBAM. So all countries agree with the basic principles of the climate policy, but specifically they have different circumstances and options. So we need to cooperate together and some good suggestions and words and recommendations were made by present pre previous discussants. So overall, we need to think about the overall opinion to find a good way and good solution for Korea. Thank you for your suggestions and proposals. And I'd like to give one or two minutes to the two other presenters. Mr. Kwan, could you give us a comment for about one or two minutes? As Managing Director Hong presented, the role of government is very important and I'm fully agree with that. Companies are responding to new systems and policies and regulations. And Korea followed the EU ETS model with necessary modifications, but we need to think about how to get some exemptions or reductions at the national level. If there will be no exemptions, so we need to think about other measures like the measuring of the emissions all data are held by the government so based on the data we uh, need to consider ways to minimize the administrative burden of each companies so government level action is required i think that's all from my side Thank you. Um, it's it's wonderful to 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 listen to all of these experts' um, point of view. So I'm a true believer, strong believer of market mechanism and price of carbon, and uh, I've been working on the ETS for over ten years in China. So so but always I I believe uh, ETS is not the goal, uh, or carbon price or any form of price is not our goal. Uh, to fight with climate change is the goal. Um, so climate change is not a zero sum game. And even if everything of our policies instrument works, we might help with the climate change. Um, so I think collaboration is one of the core. So whether CBAM will be a effective tool or not, is really depends on how they frame CBAM or how the detailed design is. It should be a policy and we hope it could be a policy that encourage carbon uh, emission reduction than just a simple trade uh, policy. So, so I, I do believe that collaboration, not only between US, EU, um, or e, is only a policy between EU and China, and like it's, it, there should be more dialogue between, for example, Korea and China or Japan and all of the other countries that will be influenced. It should be an, a helpful mechanism to, to go forward. Thank you.
Well, actually, when you look at the program, initially we plan to invite the Japanese speakers, and we are much uh, acquainted with the individual, but uh, there are some issues maybe in Ch in Japan. So the person was not available, so he could or she could not made it. So just for your reference for 15 seconds, well, various interactions and uh, we have collected information on Japan. But basically, there are some many similarities that we can encounter between Japan and Korea, as I mentioned, when it comes to the response. There is no ETS, national ETS in China, in Japan. So that is a difference when it comes to the industry. From the perspective of Japan and Korea, there are no difficult, no uh, big differences. When it comes to the Japanese government, like our country, there are many interested in CBAM, and particularly uh, the METI as a center organization. They want to lead in response to the CBM, and they're collecting information accordingly. So I believe there are rate and C perspective. So because the uh, we have to wait and see because the CBAM is not definitely set at this moment. So we have to wait and see as well. So there were many comments uh, from the experts, but I believe that the major key countries should share information in good sense and also to enhance their understanding together and collaborate something that they need to collaborate. As uh, Dr. Zhao Lulu said that we are not going to um, it's not an issue just designing the CBAM or not. What we have to do is to end the climate change. So we have to come up with the cost-effective uh, policy means to meet our goal. So there is uh, some of the good uh, side that the EU uh, made in, in their initiative that we need to support, of course. In the sense, we have shared the global communities trend, and also as we do have the ETS system. So there is some information that we shared. And also when it comes to the trends in the key countries like Canada, e US, some of the information and data were shared today. And uh, we have invited uh, renowned experts from industry in fields. And according to their in opinion, if the new president got interested in these issues, then I believe that that could be one of the good um, opportunity that we could uh, provide some of the good uh, food for thoughts by collecting the data and the information and insights from the experts. And I believe that this ends our program now. And from the perspective of CSD Lab, this is the second seminar because we had this July. And going forward, we're going to hold this uh, continuously, the seminar to build stronger network. So in the sense, I would like to thank for your interest. And also I'd like to especially thank Dr. Zhao Lulu from China with this. I'm going to conclude the seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, thank you.